brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that supports life and family. 5% of your monthly plan price goes to your favorite charity. Buy the way you believe at CharityMobile.com and use promo code TRADITION. For the last several months, this channel has been exploring Pope St. Pius X's landmark encyclical Pascendi Dominici Gregis, which is on the errors of the modernists. The document is a little high level to do in, in a full single video. That is available on this channel from several years ago, but for the last several months, I've been breaking this document up into small portions. We're probably now getting into the potentially the most high level part of the entire document, and that is the section on the modernist as apologist. You will see here, Pius X basically destroy the idea of the modernist as an apologist. He exposes their methodology as essentially being a exercise in relativism to the relativistic level of the individual and the relativistic level of the individual in mass with other individuals, and a denigration of the supernatural, and a denigration of history by making the popular historical account of things the way we are to judge Scripture, which destroys the authority of Scripture and places authority into the hands of those who seem to hate Scripture and the faith the most, those who try to tell us that historically there's no basis in reality for the Church's supernatural claims. This is the part and parcel of the exercise of the modernists, and we see that today when they tell us that Jesus' miracles were the, the loaves and fishes was a miracle of sharing for just one popular example of this. We turn now to Pope St. Pius X to clarify the matter for us. The Modernist as Apologist The Modernist Apologist depends in two ways on the philosopher. First, indirectly, inasmuch as his theme is history, history dictated, as we have seen, by the philosopher. And secondly, directly, inasmuch he takes both his laws and his principles from the philosopher. Hence, the common precept of the modernist school that the new apologetics must be fed from psychological and historical sources. The modernist apologists then enter the arena by proclaiming to the rationalists that though they are defending religion, they have no intention of employing the data of the sacred books or the histories in current use in the church, and composed, according to old methods, but real history written on modern principles and according to rigorously modern methods. In all this, they are not using an argumentum ad hominem, but are stating the fact, simple fact that they hold, that the truth is to be found only in this kind of history. They feel that it is not necessary for them to dwell on their own sincerity in their writings. They are already known to, to and praised by the rationalists as fighting under the same banner. And they not only plume themselves on these encomiums, en en they are a kind of salary to them, but would only provoke nausea in a real Catholic, but use them as an offset to the reprimands of the church. But let us see how the modernist conducts his apology. The aim he sets before himself is to make the non-believer attain that experience of the Catholic religion, which, according to the system, is the basis of faith. There are two ways open to him, the objective and the subjective. The first of them proceed from agnosticism. It tends to show that religion, and especially the Catholic religion, is endowed with such vitality as to compel every psychologist and historian of good faith to recognize that its history hides some unknown element. To this end, it is necessary to prove that this religion, as it exists today, is that which was founded by Jesus Christ. That is to say, that it is the product of the progressive development of the germ which he brought into the world. Hence, it is imperative, first of all, to establish what this germ was, and this the modernist claims to be able to do by the following formula. Christ announced the coming of the kingdom of God, which was to be realized within a brief lapse of time, of which he was to become the Messiah, the divinely given agent and ordainer. Then it must be shown how this germ, always imminent and permanent in the bosom of the church, has gone on slowly developing in the course of history, adapting itself successfully to the different mediums through which it has passed, borrowing from them by vital assimilation all the dogmatic, cultural, ecclesiastical forms that served its purpose. Whilst on the other hand, it surmounted all obstacles, vanquished all enemies, and survived all assaults and combats. Anybody who well and duly considers this mass of obstacles, 
adversaries, attacks, combats, and the vitality and fecundity which the church has shown through them all, must admit that if the laws of evolution are visible in her life, they fail to explain the whole of her history. The unknown rises forth from it and presents itself before us. Thus do they argue, never suspecting that their determination of the primitive germ is an a priori of agnostic and evolutionist philosophy, and that the formula of it has been gratuitously invented for the sake of buttressing their position. But while they endeavor by this line of reasoning to secure access for the Catholic religion into souls, these new apologetics are quite ready to admit that there are many distasteful things in it. Nay, they admit openly and with ill-concealed satisfaction that they have found that even its dogma is not exempt from errors and contradictions. They add also that this is not only excusable, but, curiously enough, even right and proper. In the sacred books there are many passages referring to science or history, where manifest errors are to be found, but the subject of these books is not science or history, but religion and morals. In them, history and science serve only as a species of covering to enable the religious and moral experiences, wrapped up in them, to penetrate more readily among the masses. The masses understood science and history as they are expressed in these books, and it is clear that they had science and history been expressed in a more perfect form, this would have proved rather a hindrance than a help. Then again, the sacred books, being essentially religious, are consequently necessarily living. Now, life has its own truth and its own logic, belonging as they do to a different order, vis-a-vis -vis truth of adaptation and of proportion both with the medium in which it exists and with the end towards which it tends. Finally, the modernists, losing all sense of control, go so far as to proclaim as true and legitimate everything that is explained by life. We, venerable brethren, from whom there is but one and only truth, and who hold that the sacred books, written under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, have God for their author, declare that this is equivalent to attributing to God himself the lie of utility or officious lie. And we say with St. Augustine, In an authority so high, Admit but one officious lie, and there will not remain a single passage of those apparently difficult to practice or to believe, which on the same most pernicious rule may not be explained as a lie uttered by the author willfully and to serve a purpose. And thus it will come about, the holy doctor continues, that everybody will believe and refuse to believe what he likes or dislikes. But the modernists pursue their way daily. They grant also that certain arguments adduced in the sacred books, like those, for example, which are based on the prophecies, have no rational foundation to rest on, but they will defend them even as artifices of preaching, which are justified by life. Do they stop here? No, indeed, they are ready to admit, nay, to proclaim, that Christ himself manifestly erred in determining the time when the coming of the kingdom was to take place, and they tell us that we must not be surprised at this, since even Christ was subject to the laws of life. After this, what is to become of the dogmas of the church? The dogmas brim over with flagrant contradictions. But what matter that since, apart from the fact that vital logic accepts them, they are not repugnant to symbolic truth? Are we not dealing with the infinite, and is not the infinite an infinite variety of aspects? In short, to maintain and defend these theories, they do not hesitate to declare that the noblest homage that can be paid to the infinite is to make it to the object of contradictory positions. But when they justify even contradiction, what it is that they will refuse to justify. And that was the modernist as apologist. How they essentially destroy the faith in an effort to defend the faith. Because what does an apologist do? They try to defend the faith, to get others to become Catholic. And yes, even modernists do this, although their methods are really an exercise in bringing people to a false religion. That is unfortunately what the church is dealing with in our time. We, this constant call of evangelization to bring people to the, the gospel, but what is preached to them is not really the gospel. When the justice of God is removed from it, and Jesus becomes essentially a dispensary of graces instead of the second person of the Most Holy Trinity. I'm curious what you have to say about this, so let me know in the comments, please. Hit like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help. So to sharing this on social media, that helps as well. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.